Hey, good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. Welcome to the Church Town Church of God and turning on the lights. Let me get you a little adjusted here, see what, how that works out for us. It's good to be with you this Tuesday morning. What is it, the 28th? 7, 8th? Yeah, I think so. This is a fairly long month, isn't it? 30 days or something like that. But it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, as you can tell from the title of this morning, it's time to have a conversation. I think that for the most part, I'll be speaking with Orthodox Christians. Good morning, Rosie. Um, but you never know. Good morning, Steve. We need to have a conversation about what's happening, not only in the world per se, but in the Christian world as well. Doesn't the sanctuary look pretty? So pretty, so nice and clean. All the little upgrades that we've made, so nice. So good morning, everybody. Let me adjust this. There's my big ugly mug right in your face. But you know, um, and we'll get, we'll see, good morning. Oh, there, uh, yeah, there is no doubt about that. The beauty, I mean, the days like this, please, thank you. You know what I mean? It might be, might get up to 80 degrees. That would be awesome. Sunshine, low humidity, fantastic stuff. Like if I want the other stuff, we'll go vacation in the Caribbean or down in Florida or something like that. But we are in the mid-Atlantic. Um, my entire life, we have lived with 100 degree um, temperature swings. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to reach 100 degrees in the summertime. It's not uncommon for us to reach zero degrees in the wintertime. That's actually a very unique climate in relation to the world. So, and it's what I'm used to. It won't stop me in my older age from complaining sometimes about the cold or the heat. But um, I know that when I lived in Southern California for four years, I missed it. I missed the climate. I missed the radical swings for the, good morning, Carol. Good morning, Audrey. Good morning, Bothwell Farms. Good morning, Sandy. I missed the seasons. Um, it was sort of like being placed in a, a padded cell, just going mad. It was you know, 78 degrees and sunny pretty much all year round. In the depths, of, in the heat of summer, it would get in the mid 80s, um, and in the depths of winter, it would get in the low 70s, and that was about it. And if it were to rain, there was supposed to be a rainy season. I got there during a historic drought, <clears throat> but I did get to see some rain later on in my years there. I mean, it was front page headline news that there was a front coming in from the Pacific, and there's a good chance that Southern California would get a little bit of rain. I remember distinctly that one of the news programs and the wind was, it, was, it wasn't even blowing. It was a breezy day and it was in autumn and they must have found the one tree where the leaves actually turned brown, right? And then they put a reporter in front of this tree and they had this big news story about these leaves that were blowing. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, these people are bored. They need some weather, but that was it. I thought, you know, one of the things that really I did miss about where we live is the climate. <clears throat> so complain as I might, one, it won't do any good whatsoever, but we take these days as we can, as we get them. Like I said this morning, we'd like to begin a conversation uh, as Christians, probably Christians speaking to Christians about this issue. Uh, regarding the Supreme Court rulings and how all of a sudden Christianity is being cast again as the villain that is driving the villainous bus. When in actuality, there is a definite separation between state and the church, but this is the place, especially with abortion, this is the place where faith and culture and politics all mix. And so we really should know what we believe and why we believe it. And we should know the position that we are in given the things that we believe. Because if you can see, people are losing their collective ever-loving minds. And they're running off 
in all kinds of different directions, saying all kinds of unhelpful, hurtful, inflammatory things, regardless of where you, what, on the spectrum, if there is a spectrum of what you may think or feel, it is insanity. And we'll talk about that on the other side of our prayer. So Father, we do pray that you would be in our conversation this morning, that <clears throat> you would provide your wisdom through the power of your Holy Spirit that is made possible only through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Bless us this day and all days and may your word go out in absolutely warm hearts, turn heads, and grow the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Why don't we start with the fact that this is not a religious ruling. And here is what we've been talking about for years, where our educational system as a whole has failed. In large measure, perhaps intentionally, perhaps unintentionally, the vast majority of Americans, not, maybe not the vast majority, but a majority of Americans, I would be willing to say, don't actually understand how America was designed, how the United States of America was designed, and how the United States of America is originally designed to work. So much, it's really since World War II and the collective empowerment of the federal government in World War II, so much of what we believe as Americans, we turn right to the federal government for everything that we might need to solve every problem that we might have, to code in law any need, real or perceived. And that is not how the United States was originally designed. Good morning, everybody. So we have to understand because right now with the, with the Roe v. Wade ruling, and it's not that, everybody's calling it the Roe v. Wade ruling number two, I can't remember the name of it, but they have placed this in the realm of evangelical Christianity. These the Christians are, are driving the bus again and forcing our religion down people's throat. That's not at all what happened. Well. Abortion is banned now nationwide. It is not. In most states, very little has changed regarding the law of the land, which is created by the individual state governments. See, a federation of individual states, when we came together, they thought that there should be one body of governance that can create threads of unity through all of the states. A unified banking system providing for the common defense of all the states. Regulating interstate commerce. Since you're going to do the banking system, you should regulate. Those are actually the three largest tasks that are codified in our Constitution. The other major task of the Constitution is to defend what our founders believed were our God-given rights. So there are things that the federal government is designed to do. And then there's this big thing that the federal government is designed to protect. What are they protecting them from? protecting us from the what is supposed to be more powerful, maybe is not the right term, but more integrated state government. The individual people of the individual states were thought of as capable to decide their own laws and by their voting and their representation in the individual states, it would be the state government that drives the bus, since we're going to use that analogy. So you have an overarching federal government that is designed to regulate interstate commerce, 
provide for the common defense, provide for a national treasury and a regulated and, um, currency, and protect the human rights of all citizens so that no state government could grow tyrannical and co start creating laws that oppressed the people. Does that make sense? So if Pennsylvania were to create laws that went against the voted on constitution, that's why we have a Supreme Court. Say, well, Pennsylvania has made this law that has made it illegal to meet as a Christian. They're going to, Pennsylvania has gone tyrannical and we're shutting down all Christian churches. Theoretically, we would sue the state government. It would go to the federal government. They would say that is clearly unconstitutional. Pennsylvania, you agreed to the constitution. You need to open, let those churches open up. Now that would go for all kinds of different things. The minutia of government never was designed to be in the hands of the federal government. It was designed to be the responsibility of the state governments. So what we see with these rulings in large measure, the whole, where we see the trend of this court is to turn decisions and the responsibility for decisions back to the people of the state governments. So if we are in Pennsylvania and there is a vast majority that says, yes, absolutely, abortion should be a right or it should be legalized at least. If you're not good. See, that's a difference too. And I just made the same mistake. When a law is challenged and it is found to be constitutional, Roe v. Wade, when a law is challenged and it is found to be constitutional, that, that does not automatically make that law a right. Rights are actually written into the constitution and again, the federal government, in large measure, is created to protect them. There are many, 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 many laws that are challenged that are found to be constitutional. Yes, they fit under the Constitution. Yet, no, your rights are not being violated. All of those things. But that does not codify that law as a God-given right. We're hearing a lot about we're taking away what was made a right 50 years ago, the rights of women, the right to have an abortion, and that is not the case. So we have to think, again, more calmly, but the idea, the, what I am speaking of now is not well taught in schools. So the majority of Americans don't truly understand even what happened. And the emotionalism rises and they start screaming and chanting and believing that the Supreme Court has delegitimized itself. We hear that, right? Because they're now taking rights away from people. And in fact, the exact opposite is true. Men and women of any given state are more empowered to decide their collective fates. States' rights. So we will now gather as a people in Pennsylvania and decide what we want codified into law. And it will have nothing to do with what New York wants. And it will have nothing to do with what Maryland or Ohio wants. Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania state government will serve Shockingly enough, Pennsylvanians. But for years and years and years, and really it has come in waves in American history. <clears throat> it has come in waves in terms of the collective power of the federal government and the attitude of the people to turn to the federal government to meet every single need, every single concern that they may have. The United States was never designed to work that way. Now, will the federal government accept that responsibility? Obviously, because human beings in our natural state will love more wealth, more power, 
right? The whole system of oligarchy, oligarchical government that we operate under now. Yes, and we will see again whether these elected representatives in the executive and the legislative branches know what they're saying when they tell lies about we have stripped women of their rights or whether they are victims of the same half-hearted, ill-fated, or perhaps intentionally misdirected educational system. Regardless of why they are saying it, they are flaming the fires for their own benefit. Trying to fire people up so that more power will come their way. I said on Sunday, there are two things that you need to, to remember. One, these media streams that are 24-7, 365, if you are turning to them for your education and information, that is not a good thing. Because their reason for existence is not to inform you, it is not to educate you, it is to make money off of you. The sole reason that any network exists is to turn a profit. That is the driving force. They will use the news of the day and turn it into some sort of narrative, soap opera, whatever the case may be, to get you to watch, to get you to watch commercials, to get eyeballs on any screen and make money. If there's not enough news of the day, guess what? they make up their own news stories and then sell them as the news of the day and get you hooked into whatever network it may be. They get eyeballs on screens, they raise their advertising rates, and they make money. Now, I'm as big a capitalist as you will find, and, and, but that comes with the territory of understanding capitalism. And it is indeed the most benevolent economic system that human beings have ever come up with. Because it takes self-interest and turns it into industries that provide jobs and all of those and drives economies and, and all those different things. Okay, a little sidebar there. So remember that. These, the networks from which you are getting supposed information don't care about you. <laughs> they don't care what you know, what you believe. They're not there to inform you, educate you in any way. Their purpose, their driving force is to make money. So they're going to package whatever message they're sending. They're going to package it in such a way that it may be very enticing to you. You're going to become addicted to the stream of information like heroin in your arm and you won't take your eyeballs off the screen and they will make more money. So you, you've got to take whatever's coming across that media stream with several grains of salt. And you must actually, I don't know, read books, read scholarly <laughs> articles, uh, magazine, whatever, you know, whatever the case may be, or at the very least go from different media streams and glean what you can, all of that stuff, but you can, you can educate yourself on both the workings of government, which our, this current Supreme Court, when you see the trends of the decisions that they're making, they are throwing decisions that don't belong in the federal government back to state government. And yes, before you say that's unconstitutional, that's very constitutional. Because there is a clause in the Constitution, a catch-all clause, that basically says, whatever this Constitution does not expressly and explicitly say that it covers will be decided by the states. And, in that, and we can look at all kinds of different things. Now you can, okay, so what we're gonna, I don't wanna go too far into the weeds of that but understanding the basic premise. So people are screaming, again, screaming, 
in, in my opinion, just screaming into a hurricane about losing rights. And that has not happened. Well, now businesses are automatically saying we will actually pay for a woman to go to another state and have an abortion. How sick is that? Like, okay. <laughs> I, I, what I don't really understand with that sort of reasoning, you know, we, we, we see these abortion pills that are flying off the shelves and there's now a shortage of morning after pills and all of these different things. Because people don't, people are people. People are Romans 7. People are Romans 1 and 2. People are the screaming crowd for the crucifixion of Jesus. People in their natural state seek anything that may validate them as a human being. And if something comes down the pike that I can scream about, then I'm screaming. Look at me, look at me, look at me. This doesn't even take into account individuals who are using any sort of civil unrest, if you will, as an excuse to riot and loot and plunder and hurt people. It's a whole separate conversation there. Human beings collectively do not have a great track record of behaving well. We behave selfishly, self-centeredly, and self-servingly. And we are very, if you in any way represent standing in front of my will, I will react fiercely and I will become emotional and I will seek to hurt. Well, again, Rosie, that is going to be derived by state legislatures now and voted upon by the people. You say, well, the state legislatures, it, the, the, the laws of any given state should reflect the will of the people of that state. So if the vast majority of a particular state elect their representatives on the premise that you will not allow for any abortion, that may be the law of the land. If you elect your representatives based on the premise that there will be what, what used to be said, safe, safe legal, legal, safe, and rare abortions, right? There's a timeline or there are parameters around it. That will be the law of the land. Our governor... Tom Wolf believes in abortion up to the day of delivery. Unregulated, unfettered abortion. That if a mother before that baby's due date, any time, says, I don't want this, that that can, baby can be killed. That's the, he doesn't have that enacted into law, but those are his public statements. So at any rate, uh, you know, we saw that with the governor of Virginia as well. Well, what if, uh, you know, they, they gave him the governor of Virginia. I'm going back in the weeds again. The previous governor of Virginia, he was voted out of office when he said, no, a baby could be born and you just leave it on the table until mother decides what to do with it. Okay. No, I can't comprehend that. So, a, a Rosie, to answer your question, it could be from, from nothing or just in very extreme cases to full-term abortion and anything in between. But what the Supreme Court is saying is that the legislatures of each individual state will reflect the will of the people. Now, it may not reflect an individual's will, I certainly will not vote for representatives or a governor that believes what I just expressed. And I am in the minority as, a, as an individual believing one in the civil rights of a human being that is in the womb. And as an Orthodox Christian believing that is in fact a human being in the womb. Because once we take it from that, we take it out of the hands of the federal government so I'm, I'm trying to have a conversation here so we can all understand a little bit better. I was emotional on Sunday. And I tried to address this and I kind of fumbled through sort, you know. 
Because this is putting Christians back in, right? This is Satan just piling lies upon what we actually believe as Christians, piling lies upon the fact that the court is this, and you'll hear it say, the court is just a bunch of white evangelical men deciding what women do. That's, look at the court, first of all. Do you even know what you're saying there? That's not true, and it is not a religious or a religiously driven decision. But it is an area where faith, Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, Christianity intersects with this very cultural phenomenon of abortion. We do, as Orthodox Christians, have a view of this that is a minority view and very difficult to walk forward with in this particular climate as we are shouted down and cast upon. But let's take the next step because this is going to be at least a two-day affair, right, between you and I. The next step is to look at the baby in the womb. One of the things that we neglect to discuss when we talk about the United States Constitution is the preamble. The overarching idea of what's going to come next, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident. That all men, human beings, Right? I know sexist language, but all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Rights that are given by God, and they use the word the, your, the creator, because there were hardcore Christians among the founders, there were deists among the founders who just believed in a God who's like the big watchmaker who wound everything up and is just watching it unfold. There are agnostics among the founders and there were atheists among the founders. But agreed upon language was they are endowed by their creator because the majority of founders believe that human beings do have these overarching human rights, that we are not beasts of the field, that we are a very unique creation, and as such, we carry these very unique rights. Among them are, and they are unalienable, they're written in stone, so to speak, and they cannot be taken away. They must, in fact, be protected by government. Not administered by government, they are given by God, protected by government. That's the big paradigm shift and before I even finish the preamble, again, we see how our thinking about government has changed and has been motivated to be in one direction. We turn to government and say, oh, please, will you please allow me to? That's not the way government was designed to work in this great experiment of the United States. I am free to, with these individual liberties, and human rights, and it is the job of government not to dole them out or to regulate them harshly, harshly, because they can be regulated. You can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater, right? You can't walk up to somebody with your freedom of speech and say, I can't even, I don't even want to say it over the air, but you know, to take life and incite riots and things of that nature, right? So we know that there are boundaries because the founders knew that human beings are wicked. Okay. So human beings, it is, the, it is the purpose of the government to protect these rights, to defend them against state governments and against all local governments and all comers. Okay. We find these truths, we hold these truths to be self-evident. You can look around and you can see it. That all human beings, all men, are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among them, these are the big three, and we forget this, are the right to life. 
we have take for granted what a basic human right is. You have the right to live. It is a God-given right. As you are created, you have the right under our government to live. The right to life. The right to liberty. And what does that mean? It's going to be spelled out in the rest of the Constitution. These are the individual liberties that you are gifted by your creator. The right to life. The right to liberty. And now this one was very interesting because it originally was and the right to property. Which is interesting because that was really such a gigantic divider even just 250 years ago between the haves and the have-nots. If you were a have-not, you had no chance of buying any property. Property was the defining factor between the classes. And so the founders, they had life, liberty, and property. And I find that fascinating because then they changed it to be more larger in scope. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of your happiness. So that does make it more individualized. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, in which very well may include property. And as it turns out, as the United States were, was going to grow, they were giving plots of land away to entice people to get into the territories to, to make them states. So. so One of the primary arguments, whether it is pro-life, if you will, whether you are a Christian or not, and that is the fact that the life inside the womb has civil rights, has human rights, and that life inside the womb has the right to life. It's given, given and granted by our Constitution. This is one that we just zoom right over. Because culturally and in many cases religiously, depending on the religion and depending on your interpretation of your Christian faith, is that which has been conceived in the womb a human being from the time it is conceived. There's the crux of both discussions. If you're discussing civil rights, is that, so be it, if that is a human, when is it a human? Is it a human outside, when it comes outside of the womb and takes its first, his or her first breath? Is it a human, but just a developing human from the very moment of conception or anywhere in between? When do these civil rights kick in? So you, whether you are Christian or not, you must decide that. And Rosie, that's where state legislatures don't, you know, not following an orthodox Christian point of view can say, okay, six weeks, nine weeks, 15 weeks, heartbeat bill, when the heart starts beating, as science goes deeper and deeper back toward the moment of conception to see when is that a recognizable human being. That's what we're saying. And so religious or not, Christian or not, that is a gigantic point. When, so even if you're arguing it from a constitutional point of view, when is that, indi my views are coming through, when is that individual in a womb a human being? I, I obviously hold the orthodox Christian view that it is it, he or she is a human being from the moment of conception. Certainly you are not going to give birth to an ox or an ass. Well, some people are asses, but you know, <laughs> that's it. a little humor, lighten things up. And then finally for today, right? So we have the constitution, federal, state, civil rights. And now finally for today, 
we must know what we believe and why we believe it as Christians. And as Orthodox Christians, we believe that the Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible Word of God. It never fails in its teaching. It never fails in its intention. It never fails in the power to educate, persuade, teach, guide, direct. The purposes that God intends for his holy word will never fail. So we believe that. And if we believe that as Orthodox Christians, we believe when the Bible teaches that human beings are in fact a unique category of creation that we are made a little lower than the angels, that we are made in the likeness and the image of God himself. We are image bearers of the Most High God. We believe that God in his eternality knew us, the scriptures teach us, that he knew us before we were conceived. The scriptures teach us, Psalm 139, that he knows us in the womb. And we can go Psalm 139, Isaiah 40. I have all of these Ephesians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, Luke 1, Matthew 2. Math, you know, you can go on John, John 17. That God knew, knows us before we are conceived. He knows us in the womb as we are being formed. He knows every, the number of every ha hair on our head and every art day of our life, because he is eternal. We believe, and finally I'll leave you with this thought because I gotta go say goodbye to my beloved. And, and we'll talk more about Orthodox Christianity on Friday, and this point of view, which is very difficult to carry in a world that has absolutely gone mad, screaming at us. But we believe that Jesus Christ is fully human and fully divine. The scriptures teach us that he is fully human, son of David, fully divine, son of God. As such, it is very difficult to believe that in God's plan to create, to become incarnate in Jesus Christ, there was ever a time that he was not fully human. Do you hear that argument? You're telling me that God had this plan, but it, you know, and, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary conceived in the womb, but there was a 15 week period when there was no Messiah. There was a 15 week period when all bets are off. Mary, change your mind, have an abortion. Is not Jesus in the womb, fully human and fully divine, or is scripture lying to us? And there's where we land. That human beings are human beings from the time of conception. And that is Orthodox Christianity. You hear so many different arguments. Well, in ancient Hebrew culture, in ancient Jewish culture, before other writings outside of the Torah, they, in the Bible, there is a potion for abortion that is talked about. Yes, all of true. In an ancient Jewish culture, the old Jewish culture, the old covenant, that first, first breath taken outside of the womb was seen as the very breath of God entering into an individual. Ancient Hebrew culture also had horrific slavery and a caste system that degraded women beyond belief. I mean, what, where are you gonna cut off what we're going to accept and what we are going to say the Lord Jesus Christ built a bridge between the old understanding and the new. One of the things he built a bridge about is when a human being is created because he became incarnate in Mary's womb from the time of conception. May God bless us in this understanding, Father God. May we explore your word. May it entice us to explore your word even more so we know what we believe and why we believe it, so that we may be beacons of light as this hurricane blows over 
our beliefs. In Jesus' name, I pray for my brothers and sisters to be strong, the power and the faith that comes only from you, your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys, and we should see you Friday if you want to. I'm going to try to get this. It wouldn't let me download the uh, service on Sunday, but I'll try to get this up on YouTube. Go to the YouTube channel, like it, all those different things, share it. Um, if you think this is good information, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to de-emotionalize things and try to talk about this, what's happening in a way that folks are like, oh, okay, whether you agree or not. Because if we turn around as Christians or even as Americans, if you're following the, the civil rights point of view and just start screaming and flailing and breaking, then what's the point? Nobody's going to hear. Those who have ears to hear, hear. Well, we're, it's not very attractive that way. God bless you guys, and we'll see you Friday. You have a great day as well, Stephen. Thank you. Right? Yeah. Odd. Not. We're going to try when I get back over to the parsonage. We'll see you guys. Thank you, Rick.